Good morning, supervisors. Good morning, community. Thanks for this opportunity to provide the COVID-19 update for today. Alvaro, if I could have my slides, please. I'll start with a review of our numbers um, and then get into some of our, our key priorities and strategies for this week. Next slide, please. So this will show our, our epidemic curve, the number of cases per day since the pandemic began. And what's important about this is on the far right, which is the, the most current data, you can see that we're starting to see a plateauing effect from that forced surge, the remarkable increase in cases that we've experienced through July. And I'll expand on that in a bit. Next slide, please. This breaks down our case rates by vaccination status and illustrates um, what we all know, which is the people who are unvaccinated are at higher risk um, for being infected with COVID-19, being diagnosed, and uh, even more importantly, at much higher risk for severe illness, hospitalization, and death. Our vaccination rates among our, I'm sorry, our case rates among our unvaccinated residents are 35 per 100,000. Among our vaccinated residents, it's closer to nine. And our overall case rates right now as a county is 15 per 100,000. Next slide, please. And this just com comparing across all California counties with regards to uh, case rates shows that Marin um, there in blue um, is near the bottom, meaning that we have some of the lowest case rates in the state of California. And we'll see in a bit how that correlates to our high vaccination rates. Next slide, please. This is our current um, number of uh, number of people in Marin County hospitals. Importantly, that's not necessarily Marin County residents in hospitals, but these are the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 in our three hospitals in Marin. Um, important to note that both Kaiser and Sutter are part of regional hospital networks where um, in a county like Marin, where we have high vaccination rates, lower case counts and lower COVID-19 census, um, for hospitalizations, many of those individuals end up being um, in, coming from outside of Marin County into our hospitals, um, especially coming from areas with lower vaccination rates, higher case rates, where the hospitals may be more impacted. So some fraction of these 19 are Marin County residents, but not all. Importantly, two or three of those 19 currently are vaccinated, the rest are unvaccinated. Um, over 90% of our hospitalizations over the past three months have been among unvaccinated people. Um, and when we calculate that out, the rate, the risk of being hospitalized in Marin County, if you are unvaccinated, is 50 times higher than the risk for being hospitalized with COVID-19 if you are vaccinated. And then that's based on our, our local data. Next slide, please. And this shows um, our, our the prevalence of the different variants of COVID-19 in Marin County. The green is the Delta variant and really shows that, you know, tells the story that over time we've had an increasing proportion of our cases that are the Delta variant. Um, now it's about 95% of our cases are the Delta variant and 100% of the cases that were detected in the last week that were sequenced are the Delta variant. Next slide, please. These are our vaccination rates, um, shows that 95.4% of our eligible residents above age 12 have been vaccinated with at least one dose, um, and 88.2% of our residents who are eligible are fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. And that places Marin as the, as the most highly vaccinated um, county still in the, in the state of California. Next slide, please. We've had a goal to make sure that all communities are maintaining that, that high standard of high vaccination rates across the county. And it is our mobile, via, mobile vans um, and other strategies have really made sure that any county, any community that is falling behind is prioritized week by week. Um, and that has been a successful strategy. And all cities and towns in Marin have vaccination rates that are within 10% of the county average. Next slide, please. See, another point there um, is that uh, by age, the, the least vaccinated age groups are 12 to 17 year olds um, and they are 88% vaccinated. 
Our most highly vaccinated age group is our, our residents above age 65 at 98% vaccination rates. And then if we go to our uh, race ethnicity, 80 to our lowest, our least vaccinated group is our African-American black residents. Um, and they are at 82% vaccination rates. And our Latinx residents are 98% vaccinated. So virtually all, all groups geographically and demographically and racial ethnic groups are above 80% vaccination rates in the county. Um, so there's been a lot of action on the vaccination front over the past um, couple of weeks. I'll just summarize some of the key elements. First of all, Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine was FDA approved yesterday. Um, the term, the, the word is carmirnity. Um, I think we'll just keep calling it the Pfizer vaccine. Um, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson are pending, um, not yet fully approved by the FDA, still under emergency use authorization. Also third doses for immunocompromised people, so people with severely or moderately immunocompromised states were approved last week and they are available and ran through healthcare pharmacies and public health. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we have boosters. Uh, the White House announced that booster doses for everyone who was vaccinated are, are going to be um, starting around September 20th. Importantly, we're still waiting from the C for the CDC and the FDA to formalize that, but that's the message that's coming from the White House, likely to be eight months after the second dose, um, signaling that our public health focus, when we reach that point, will be focusing on our most vulnerable residents. Next slide, please. So currently, because their third doses are now available for our most our severely immunocompromised patients, we recognize that not all healthcare providers had the capacity to really match the demand for their patients that were cancer patients, uh, organ transplant patients, patients with HIV, you know, frank, um, clinically immunocompromised states. We have um, offered last Saturday where we had over 800 individuals vaccinated. Um, and then this coming Saturday, again, at the Marin Center exhibit hall where, where so many of our residents have been vaccinated in the earlier phases of our vaccine campaign, have kind of remobilized that, that setting um, and have, have vaccinated and we'll be offering vaccines for our severely immunocompromised residents again. Um, and anyone wants who wants to be vaccinated can go to getvaccinated.marin, getvaccinatedmarin.org um, and, uh, and sign up for vaccines there. Next slide, please. In terms of policies, there's been also a lot of action on the policy front. Um, to summarize, there are really three important tiers of vaccine policies that I'll review. First is mandatory vaccination. And those are, that's unless a medical or religious exemption. And that's, that's a, those are policies that are being applied in hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, jail and prison medical settings, really those highest risk settings where there's mandatory vaccination. Um, the next level of policy is um, is that employees must verify their status as being vaccinated or unvaccinated. And if they are not vaccinated to undergo weekly testing. And these policies applied to all first responders through an order that I issued um, last Friday, um, as well as outpatient clinics under a state order. So all basically all medical providers also need to um, either supply proof of vaccination or undergo weekly testing. Um, school staff, importantly, all school staff um, need to um, either be vaccinated or undergo weekly testing and, and staff in congregate living facilities. And then finally, um, verifying vaccination status rather than self-attestation. Um, individuals or all municipal employees across the, across the counties and school students who are eligibly vaccinated must um, provide proof of their vaccination status rather than relying on self-attestation. Next slide, please. So I want to get to this, this question of whether or not we are seeing a plateau in our cases um, in Marin County. Um, the New York Times, I just heard this morning, did a story about how some areas in the, across the country that have high vaccination rates may be seeing signs of that in terms of their case rates in this fourth stage. Obviously, the fourth surge is still very much uh, occurring across the county, especially across this nation, um, especially in places with lower vaccination rates. But places like Marin County that have um, you know, really an outlier in terms of higher vaccination rates, I think are beginning to demonstrate the benefit of those high vaccination rates in terms of 
um, reducing that, the, the, the trajectory of that surge. So these are our numbers in Marin. And then looking at the, on the top there, you see our, our daily new cases. We peaked at about August 1 at about 51 cases on average per day. We're now closer to about 40 cases on average per day. I wouldn't call that necessarily a reliable decline in cases statistically, but it is certainly, I think, a reliable plateau in cases. So I think we can say that we've, we've reached a plateau. It is still a plateau of high transmission with 15 per 100,000 per day, um, but it is not, you know, I think we can feel reassured that we're not seeing that rapid increase that we had seen over July. And then really substantiating that, um, the, the hypothesis that this is a true plateau in cases is that the percent positive has also um, plateaued and in fact is declining, co coinciding with that decrease in case counts. Next slide, please. And this is another way of looking at, this is some of the excellent work of our epidemiology team looking across the county. The question I wanted to answer is, are we seeing a true plateau in cases? Um, and might that be related to our vaccination rates? Because obviously that has policy implications. If we saw unabated increase in cases, we might need to be more aggressive in terms of the, the, the policies that we might impose. If we are seeing an abatement in the, in the surge in cases, that might reassure us that where we are right now, is a good place to be in terms of our policies. When we look across the state of California, 58 counties, what we see is there's clearly an association between the velocity, the, the, the trajectory of increased cases and vaccination rates. On the upper right of this, what you see is case counties, on the, sorry, on the upper left, you have counties that have high vaccination rates and low case rates. And on the lower right, you see counties that have low vaccination rates and high case rates. If there's no association between those things, that line is flat. That black line there would be flat. When there's a true association between, you see a curve in that line, and there's clearly a slope to that line. And this is a statistically significant demonstration of the relationship between vaccination rates and case rates during this current surge, and, and, and offers us reassurance that the plateau we're seeing is, um, is likely credit to the fact that we've been so successful in our vaccination campaign. Next slide, please. So, you know, invites the question of when might policies become less restrictive? Um, first of all, important to recognize that many of the policies that are in place in Marin are due to state regulations. Um, and so we would have to, you know, we would not be, be able to be less restrictive than the state at any point. So we would have to wait until state regulations are lifted where those policies are applicable. Some are state, some are local. There's no clear, like a priori right now, set criteria for when we would lift. It's not like when we were back in that blueprint for a safer economy where we had a set of policies that corresponded exactly to case rates. There's other factors that we need to take into account, including what, what um, strains are circulating, what are the characteristics of those strains, is there another variant? But the primary factor will be community transmission rates. And the best way to determine what community transmission rates are is the data I just shared with you in terms of case rates and percent positivity. So we are now currently at 15 cases per 100,000 per day. For reference, the purple tier was seven or greater. So we're sort of still in deep purple. Um, the orange tier is less than four cases per 100,000 per day. And that's the kind of information we'll be looking to to determine when we might resume some things that, you know, that we value so much, including um, gathering in person for, for board meetings, other things, maybe lifting some of the mask recommendations, um, but really it's too early to take those steps uh, because we are still seeing significant rates of community transmission. Next slide, please. We are reopening schools this week, last week, next week, across the county, this is the time. Um, obviously doing so cautiously as we see, you know, the Delta variant, um, much more infectious, presents new challenges to safely reopening schools. We're building on the success of last year. Um, Marin was, uh, was a county that had among the first to be really having all schools fully open to classroom-based learning. Um, we now are working, we had a 30-point plan. This year, it's a 32-point school site-specific protection plan that all schools have. We're working in close partnership between public health schools. We have weekly meetings with our school-based public health liaisons, and we're monitoring the situation very, very closely to move forward and adapt our policies as needed. Next slide, please. 
just remind, remind everyone of the vaccination opportunities. It's super high value for all of us. You know, as we talk about boosters and added doses for people who are already, already vaccinated, really important to step back and remember the greatest value in terms of vaccinations is people who are going from the status of being unvaccinated and fully unprotected to being vaccinated. So our priority is still first doses for people who are unvaccinated while we continue, while we move towards a strategic response to offering third doses for people who are already vaccinated. So these are the, the mobile clinics that we have. You know, West Marin will be in Novato, San Rafael, um, and then uh, reminding people that almost all pharmacies are also, especially the, you know, the national chain pharmacies are offering vaccines um, mostly on a walk-in basis or go online to schedule an appointment. And they're listed on the bottom there. Getvaccinatedmarin.org is your source for, uh, for vaccinations, whether it's boost third doses or, or first doses. Next slide, please. So in summary, case rates are stabilizing at a high level of community transmission. We remain at risk. You know, there are some factors to take into account, including um, school reopenings. We're gonna have to be monitoring community transmission rates very carefully as we take that step. The Delta variant is the dominant strain. High vaccination rates are protecting us as individuals against severe illness, hospitalization, and death, um, and as a community. New FDA vaccine product approvals, extra dose approvals, and vaccination policies are supporting the role of vaccinations in our strategy. Um, schools are reopening cautiously, and vaccination opportunities abound countywide. Next slide, please. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Willis. I'm going to bring you back to the board for questions. Start with Supervisor Connolly. Thank you, Dr. Willis. Good morning, everyone. As always, I want to start with uh, tremendous appreciation uh, to you and your public health team and, and our healthcare workers at large. Uh, thank you uh, for re really uh, providing this level of, of data and transparency. Uh, so some of this will just kind of be digging a little bit deeper into some of the areas you covered. Uh, perhaps a little bit of new ground. On the Pfizer vaccine, um, as we all know, it has received FDA approval. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what does that signify um, and what are the policy implications? And then where do things stand for Moderna and J&J &J in terms of your best estimate on timing of FDA approval for those vaccines? Yes, yeah, so the, um, the approval of the Pfizer vaccine is 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 great news. Uh, it's not a surprise. You know the the way the 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 approval process works for the FDA is that you have the emergency use authorization that's based on the clinical trials, robust clinical trials, highly reassuring that it's highly effective and safe. And what we've seen now, over you know, as it's rolled out into the population, where you move from thousands to literally millions of individuals who are being monitored. Um, is just an affirmation of what had been determined in the clinical trials. Um, and it just takes time to assemble that sort of that level of, of data for that approval process under the FDA. So it's certainly not a surprise to, to us that it was approved, um, but, the, but the, 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 the approval application was submitted later for the Pfizer, for the Moderna and the, and the Johnson & Johnson. So we would expect, based on what our experience has been for both of those other products, with the wide rollout across the population for the same result of FDA approval, but they just haven't had as much time under their belt as the, as the Pfizer product had. And you spoke about uh, booster shots initially for immunocompromised. And, and by the way, very uh, good to hear that that initial rollout appears to be going successfully in Marin County. Wondering if you can talk about uh, booster shots more generally vis-a-vis uh, -vis CDC guidelines and your understanding uh, to the broader public, what would be the timing, uh, who would qualify and those uh, sorts of questions? Right, well, there's an important distinction of between the third dose and the booster for one thing. So the third dose, we're really seeing it as, as, a, as a clinical intervention for people who are in that narrow group who really were not able to mount a full immune response to the first vaccination series they received because they have a medical condition that impairs their immune system. 
A vaccine is designed to improve your antibodies, your B cells or T cells, really prime your immune system. If the virus is introduced, if you're exposed to the virus, you're able to fight it off. People who are undergoing chemotherapy, for example, their immune systems are, are, are significantly weaker. So when they're vaccinated the first time, they may have very few antibodies. So it makes sense to offer those people a third dose because it's really just adding to that stimulus. Um, and that's where we are right now. And we estimate there's about 10,000 people in Marin that fit into that category based on what we know from our hospitals and healthcare providers. And we're providing that vaccine. Separately, the booster concept is actually just based on, on waning immunity over time of the vaccines that we've already administered. And there's evidence that when you look at antibody levels for people that have been vaccinated six to eight months ago, yeah, there are fewer antibodies, but that's expected. We never, you know, that's, that's true for all vaccines. I think what's important there is where is it significant that someone who had been vaccinated eight months ago might be at significantly higher risk for severe illness. And when you look at the data, it really is people who are already some way, in some ways compromised, right? Not necessarily necessarily frankly immunocompromised with the third doses, but older residents, have maybe have a greater level of waning immunity where that booster might be more, more beneficial to them. So we're really gonna be focusing as, as we get into September 20th on those individuals who are vaccinated eighth month early who are at highest risk for, or for severe illness, where we really wanna brush up that immune, immune response. Um, and that's going to be, in, in our case, will be our, our nursing home residents, our skilled nursing facilities, our long-term care facilities for the elderly, and we'll have mobile teams traveling to those areas to get them vaccinated. When it comes to you know, your college student who's otherwise healthy, who was vaccinated earlier on, first of all, fewer of them will have been vaccinated early on because if you remember back in January and February and December, we were vaccinating higher risk people, first responders, healthcare, and older residents. But from an immunologic standpoint, um, people who are fully vaccinated are well protected over time. So we really wanna make sure that not everyone is rushing the door you know, on September 20th to get that booster shot because the vast majority of people don't need it. Many, most won't qualify because it's not eight months. But I think additionally, those who are healthy enough to not need that booster, um, the analogy I've heard is that you've got, you, you don't need to send a second life jacket out to someone, right? There's people, and that's, there's an ethical component to this that I think we need to acknowledge across the world, which is when most of the world, or many of the people in the world don't have access to the first doses, it feels a little bit unethical to be offering a second life jacket to someone who we know will, will be just fine, like our younger non-immunocompromised residents. So that's something we'll be navigating together as we move forward. So to summarize time frame, they'll start to roll out more broadly uh, around uh, October uh, or September 20th. September 20th. And, then, and then we're looking at kind of eight months from when you receive your last dose. Okay, great. Where do things stand on vaccine availability for children under 12? You know, still, still in the FDA, CDC process. I mean, those those clinical trials are are well underway. They're amassing, you know, good data um, to submit for the approval. We're look, we're we're being told it's probably going to be in October, um, and that's you know, that's actually a higher value for us than than boosting otherwise healthy residents. Uh, we really want to get unvaccinated people vaccinated, so we'll be prioritizing vaccinating our our school age children. Um, in terms of our own strategy as, as public health, as soon as we're able to, and we already have uh, plans in place with the schools to do that efficiently. As of August 19th, uh, there are 18 hospitalizations in Marin and five ICU cases. Are we seeing vaccinated people in the hospital? We are seeing some vaccinated people in the hospital, but at much lower rates. I mean, I, you know, again, the, the risk in Marin of being hospitalized with COVID-19 is 50 times higher if you're unvaccinated. Um, you know, the, the, fortunately we have very high, you know, above 90%, 95% of our residents who are eligible have been vaccinated with at least one dose. Um, so there's, there's a high level of protection there. And many, many people hospitalized in Marin are, are imported from other counties. They don't have that benefit of high vaccination rates. Um, but yes, clear, clear association undeniable association between uh, the risk for hospitalization and vaccine status. Thanks. And I just want to finally and briefly turn to masking. Uh, what metrics are you using to consider changes to the masking mandate? If you could outline that. 
Yeah, that's that would fit into you know that that question of what would be the what would be the 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 setting the conditions that would allow us to relax policies across a variety of different sectors, um, and it would be really based on community transmission rates. Right now, we're seeing you know 50, 15 cases per hundred thousand residents. That's categorized by the CDC and in any other system as high levels of community transmission. So right now, we are seeing high levels of community transmission. This is not the time to relax uh, mask mandates. Um, in fact, adjacent counties are imposing, newly imposing mask mandates. And again, anyone who has been soft on that particular policy is learning the hard way that um, it was, you know, especially with the Delta variant, um, we need to really be, we need to be at our best in terms of covering our faces um, in indoor settings, especially in public indoor settings. Um, so we would look to, to case rates that are significantly lower than they are now to relax that particular policy. And we have the fortune of a you know, historical model where we have the purple, red, orange. Orange tier, less than four cases per 100,000 um, is, um, is a logical step. Uh, again, we haven't finalized what the criteria would be, but that's where we're leaning. Great, and finally, you spoke about schools, which is such an important component, and we really appreciate uh, everyone associated with the school stepping up. And really just to, to kind of drive home the point, um, can you offer some uh, comments on the varying levels of protection offered, for example, when one person is wearing a mask, both people are wearing a mask, or no one is wearing a mask, and how that impacts a given setting in terms of uh, safety. Yeah, our, our school policies are really to, is universal masking. Um, and the reason universal masking is so important, and maybe the best way to illustrate this is just sort of a, to imagine, I'm, so imagine I'm infected with COVID-19. Why do I cover my face? And why do, I, why do we hope that the person who I expose is covering their face? So if I'm covering my face and I'm infected with COVID-19, it reduces the risk that I would, exp that I would infect someone else about, by up to about 70%, right? So if I'm infected, I may not know it, I may, I may not have symptoms. I'm covering my face because it's my routine, not because I know I'm infected, but just because it's my everyday routine. It all, right, on that, right off the bat, reduces the risk by 70% that I would infect someone else. And then let's say the exposed person, if they're covering their face, it reduces their risk individually by about another 20% that they are covering their face. So that combined benefit those, those benefits sum into a combined benefit, the, the, the risk has reduced significantly, but that particular exchange between myself and an exposed individual would lead to transmission. But you don't know upfront who's infected and who isn't. And that's why it's so important for it just to be the routine of universal masking and what we call mask on mask exposures, where both individuals are wearing masks um, are really critical, especially as we reopen schools in the era of, of Delta. What you're saying is that is by far the safest scenario, mask on mask. That's right. And if it, and, and importantly, the, the CDC's guidance on quarantine, which we are following in Marin, um, it's called modified quarantine. So if, that, if either of those two individuals in a school setting is unmasked, that exposure will require the, uh, that, that, that child who is not infected and exposed to stay out of school for at least five days in, in quarantine and then be tested. And then they, if they're negative, they can go back to school two days later. If they're both masked, that exposure, that exposed child, because the risk has been d diminished so much, that exposed child can actually stay in school under modified quarantine. So schools that have universal masking are gonna be much less disrupted when there are cases on campus. And we expect there to be cases on campus, unfortunately, because of the prevalence of community transmission with Delta. So if you imagine there's a classroom where people aren't all covering their faces, everyone who is exposed would need to stay home for at least five days. That would be significantly disruptive to the, the social and academic experience. Thank you very much.